welcome to our spring celebration event. We're going to have this once a year, and it's all for you guys. So I appreciate your being here. So thank you very much. We're going to start with diabetes research updates. I'm Anita Swamy, for those of you whom I haven't met. So before we talk about where we've gone with diabetes, I thought it would be good to talk about where we've come from. So um, I always like to start off by asking people, do you know when insulin was invented? Obviously, it's on the slide. Try not to look at the slide or discovered. Because people always say, well, when is there going to be a cure? Right. Somebody raised their hand here. Yes, honey. <laughs> Good. She reads slides very well. 1921, but smart kid. What's your name? Amia. Amia. Thank you, Amia. 1921, that's right. So two gentlemen named Banting and Best discovered insulin um, in 1921. And the way they did it is sort of serendipitous. A long time ago, they were looking at the pancreas for fat enzymes. It also helps with fat metabolism. So they happened to take a pancreas out of dogs just to see what would happen to their fat when they did that. And guess what they found? These dogs became diabetic. And they said, something in the pancreas must also control the sugar. So then they looked more at that organ, and they said, this is the beta cells. And they were able to take pancreas from another organism, extract the cells that make insulin, extract insulin, give it back to the dogs that lost their pancreas, and make them live. So that's how this was discovered. So the first human who was treated was in 1922 a year after it was discovered. And it's weird because we do this the other way now. It was a 14-year-old boy. Now you have to do a treatment for like 20 years in an adult before you can do it in a kid. But there, the guinea pig was a kid first. Um, and he went on to survive until 27. And he died of pneumonia, not diabetes. So that's pretty remarkable. We haven't even had this for 100 years. So whenever people ask about why isn't there a cure, I say, look at how far we've come in just 80 to 90 years. So just to go through the timeline of a few other things, um, it wasn't until the 1940s that we had the first insulin, which was NPH insulin. And then we went on to the 50s, started having test strips as a way to figure out how to check your glucose. We didn't even have that until then. And then in the 1960s is when the first pancreatic transplants happened. They weren't very successful, as you can imagine, because we didn't have anything to, re to stop rejecting those. So we did them, but they didn't work very well. In the 1970s is when we had our first meters, and pumps really came out later in the 70s to 80s. So pumps have only been around for 30 years, not that long. And our version is way different than the one that came out first, which was as big as a backpack. Can you imagine wearing that all day? <laughs> you certainly can't swim with it. Um, and then we, we discovered a way to make insulin that's human insulin with recombinant DNA technology. Do you know where we got it from before that? Can anyone tell me where we got our insulin from? Michael? Excellent. Pork and cattle. OK, so beef and pork gave us our insulin before it was uh, recombinant DNA technology enabled us to make it. And then we had our rapid acting insulin in the 1990s. That's your Humalog Novolog, as you know it, and then Epidra came much later. And then the long-acting insulins did not come around until 2000, 2003 is when Lantus and Glargine insulin came into the US, and then Levomir followed. So that's 2003. So this is all very new stuff. So the therapies that you're on are very current. This is not something that's been around for years. We've been working a long time to improve stuff. But this is where we've come in the past 80 years. So I'm going to show you what we're doing in the next 10. Next slide. So to go over what is type 1 diabetes, we all know that it's a defect in your pancreas, right? So this is where our pancreas sits. It's kind of in the middle to left side of our body right here. And what does it make? Yes? Excellent. Excellent job. So it makes insulin, Matthew. Very good. And uh, what else does it make? Does anyone know? Glucagon, good job. So the pancreas not only makes insulin, but it makes glucagon. Were you guys going to guess that too? Yeah, OK, good job. So glucagon. So in diabetics, it's not just the beta cells that suffer, but many of the other cells too, including glucagon response. So the beta cell is in a small portion of the pancreas, OK? So these are beta cells, but there are other cells in there too. And 
what happens as a primary defect in type 1 diabetes? Do you guys know? What actually happens to those cells? Can anyone tell me? Yes. Do you want to just get up here? Because I think, I, think, I think he's doing a good job. That's right. The immune system attacks these cells. So let's go back over what is this immune system. So we have a very cool mechanism in our body that tells us who we are so that if anything foreign comes in, it gets attacked. So every cell in my body has a little marker on it that says, I'm Anita. Don't hurt me. And every cell in your body has your own marker. So that way, when a foreign substance comes in and someone coughs on you on the subway or wherever you may be, you inhale that virus. When that comes in, that doesn't have that specific marker. So the immune system says, that's foreign. I'm going to kill that. OK? And that's how it works. So that any time a foreign substance invades your body, it's able to get rid of it. That's how we're able to get rid of a cold. That's why we mount a fever. A fever is an indication that your immune system is being activated. It's not always a bad thing, although we freak out about it, right? Um, so all it means is that that system is working. And these soldiers are going to war to fight against this foreign substance. But what happens in diabetes and other immune system um, error conditions, autoimmune diseases, is your immune system doesn't recognize that there's a marker on that cell. It doesn't see the little Anita sign on the pancreas. And it thinks that it's a foreign substance, almost like a bacteria or a virus, and it attacks it inappropriately. OK? So that is the premise of type 1 diabetes. That's why that happens. And in diabetes, it happens to be that the immune system attacks the beta cells, OK? And the pancreas in general, but mainly the beta cells. What other immune system conditions? Can anyone name a couple? Any other diseases that go along with type 1 diabetes that we often see? What's that? Thyroid. thyroid. That's right. Thyroid disease. So in that case, the immune system is attacking the thyroid and thinking that there's something wrong when it's actually your own body. Yes? Celiac. Celiac. Excellent. Celiac disease. That's right. And yes, Andrea? Rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis. Very good. That's a joint disease. So it's attacking your joints. And lupus, it's attacking your kidneys. So the same concept, it thinks that these things are foreign when they're not. And that is why if you have one of them, you're at risk for your immune system going awry and attacking other organs. And that's why we check your kids and leech them of blood every year. It's not to be mean, but to make sure that we're checking these other organs to see that they're functioning properly, OK? So whenever I give you lab forms, you go, ah, we forgot to do the labs. Now you know why it's so important and we get on your case. So next slide. So I expect you to memorize this, and I will quiz you later. Um, but basically, this is to show you that there are cells called dendritic cells that actually attack the beta cells and cause them to die. And that's what results in this immune system attack on the beta cell, and then it doesn't work. So one of the goals of therapy is to say, can I prevent this cell from attacking this cell so that the whole process doesn't even happen? OK? Wouldn't that be nice? Because then you wouldn't have diabetes. But the issue is that it's a lot harder to do than the conceptual picture up here. But this is what essentially goes wrong, is dendritic cells attack the beta cells, and then you have diabetes. So there is some stuff that we're looking at today that I'm going to go over with you guys in a second. Next slide. Um, so these are some of the areas that I wanted to discuss, because there's so many. I asked some of you for anything that you saw on TV and articles. I thank everyone who sent me stuff. I've incorporated most everything in here. Um, so we have a lot to talk about in the next 30 minutes. So one is antigen-specific therapies, beta cell regeneration, artificial pancreas, something called encapsulation. Uh, I think the Denovelis has gave me an article uh, alluding to that. And then biomarkers. What are glucose modulating agents? That's smart insulin, if anybody's heard of that. And primary and secondary prevention research, as well as complication prevention, especially eye disease. So I'm going to cover all of this in a little while. Next slide. So antigen-specific therapies is the first thing I want to talk about. So remember the beta cell that's being attacked inappropriately by those dendritic cells in the immune system? So we're thinking that maybe we could change these um, and one of the first people that did research is a guy that I actually used to work with, Massimo Trucco, in University of Pittsburgh. 
Um, and I wish through osmosis I became as smart as he is. But in 2009, he created a vaccine in adults. And he gave it back to them using their own cells to prevent those cells from attacking their beta cells inappropriately, adults who are at high risk for type 1 diabetes. Um, the unfortunate part is it sort of worked. It didn't work great. Um, and they're still being followed, because this was just in 2009. So he's seeing whether it's working long term to prevent diabetes. And there were disappointing results when they tried this in children who already had diabetes. They said, what if you already had diabetes? Can I preserve those beta cells and keep them from being attacked? So they've done these studies already, and it's kind of disappointing. There weren't great results. There was not a way to give them something to prevent those cells from being attacked already. Then JDRF teamed up with a company called Selecta Biosciences in Massachusetts. And they said, can we prevent diabetes in kids who are at high risk? Who's at high risk? Siblings, right? So family members of those with diabetes who have antibodies that are positive. So when I say antibodies that are positive, that means that they already have evidence that there's some level of attack of the beta cells and that eventually they may get diabetes. So they took a group of these kids who have family members and antibody positivity and they said, can I give them something that makes those antibodies not act against the beta cell? And this is a study right now called the Diaprevit study, um, being done by a woman in Sweden, Dr. Larson. And they're doing something called a GAD antibody specific study. So that's one of the antibodies that we also measure when we diagnose a child with type 1 diabetes to see whether it actually exists. It's one of the strongest markers of type 1. So that is the attacker, OK? Um, and so we're seeing how many of those people have those attackers present. She's seeing, can I get rid of that attacker by giving a substance that makes that go away? OK, so this was funded in 2011, refunded. So it's an ongoing trial. Pretty cool stuff. Next slide. I know this is very complex, so feel free to ask questions later. So the next concept is not really looking at, can I prevent this immune system from attacking? But can I make more of these beta cells? Let's say they're being attacked. OK, can I make more so that I don't worry about the ones that are being killed? OK? And the reason is less than 2% of the pancreas actually is beta cells, very small part. So we don't have a ton of them, OK? And so we can get them from transplants, right? That's how an islet cell transplant works. But what's the problem with transplants? They're foreign. Excellent. Very good job. They're foreign. They're not you. So what does the immune system do to those? They reject it. So it means it's also going to be attacked and killed because the body says, this is not my body. What are you putting inside of me? Okay. So the other problem with transplants is there's five bajillion people who need one. How many people are donating them? Not many. So it's hard to get it. In order for you to receive a transplant from another person, I have to shut down my system that says, I'm Anita. So that means I have to shut my immune system down to accept their foreign product, or their pancreas. And in the process of shutting down my immune system, guess what happens? You get sick. You get sick. Again, you too. Michael and what's your name, honey? Jared? They could just run this. But you get sick. So if I shut down my immune system, somebody coughs on me, I'm not going to be able to fight that off. So that's not, does that sound like a safe thing to do in a kid? Probably not. And so they've been successful, but there's a lot of issues around those transplants. And there's not enough donors. So they said, what if we could create new beta cells? Sounds like a nice idea, right? So we're looking at making more from existing cells. So if you have some beta cells, can we have them replicate? or making more from stem cells. Those are the two main things I'm going to cover in this, okay? You can also try to program other cells to go back and become beta cells, and also make sure that they survive. But this is what I'm going to focus on in the interest of time and what's kind of hot now. Next slide. So regeneration of existing cells. There's a guy named Dr. Dor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Very exciting research. And he looked at regeneration of beta cells with an enzyme called gluco kinase. Glucokinase is an enzyme that actually senses that there's sugar out there and that insulin needs to be released in order to take care of that sugar. 
And he's, he also noticed that this enzyme is responsible for generation of beta cells. So he said, when this enzyme is present, you make beta cells. So is there a way that I can have that happen without having a lot of exposure to high blood sugars? So he actually did amazing mice studies that showed that you can generate beta cells in mice. Now, we are not rodents. Um, however, um, I think that this is really promising. This was only discovered this past year, you guys. So this is being ongoing funded research to see, can I regenerate beta cells? Um, depending upon this enzyme. Next slide. Then, I want to talk briefly about stem cells. Um, we have a lot more stuff coming up in stem cell research, and the reason is because there was a ban on this. Are you guys familiar with that? So whatever your political inclination, there was a ban on this until 2009. In March 2009, Obama lifted this ban so that we can continue doing stem cell research. And so lately, we've had more and more stuff come up. And what are stem cells? So these are, there's three qualities of stem cells. They're not specialized, meaning they can be anything. And so they can become any type of tissue depending upon the environment you put them in. They divide and keep renewing themselves, okay? And they come from embryos, and that's the controversy. Or you can actually get adult stem cells, which we're looking at as well. Adult stem cells are a little bit more differentiated, so it's harder, but it's taking a cell that's already something else, making it go back and become another substance, such as a beta cell or another um, cell or organ. So that's a little tougher to do. Um, it's easier to go from something that is nothing and create a new beta cell. So that's what we're looking at. This kind of started, the concept was in 1981 with mouse studies, and then it wasn't until 1998 that people looked at human embryos from in vitro fertilization. These are women that could not get pregnant that had in vitro fertilization done. And if you guys know anything about in vitro, you end up taking a bunch of cells and seeing what can get fertilized, and only a few of those go back into the, the woman. Um, and the remainder of those could be viable. So the woman signs a consent form. That's what we use in research. There's some lines of those cells that we're still using in research. So it's all under these people's consent. Um, but that's where we get these embryonic stem cell lines. And then in 2006, they discovered that you could actually, instead of getting them all from embryos, take cells that are adult stem cells that actually exist in our system and make them go back and reprogram them to become pluripotent stem cells, which means brand new again. Okay, next slide. So how do stem cells work and have they worked? So it's not the newest thing, actually. We've used stem cells for years now. Um, have you guys heard of people getting bone marrow transplants? That's a stem cell transplant, OK? So what they're getting, essentially, is blood cells from somebody else. And that replaces their own blood cells. So we use it for blood-borne cancers like leukemia and lymphoma, OK? And those have worked, right? You see people with bone marrow transplants who survive? Absolutely. So that's what that's based on. Umbilical cord blood is another source of blood cells, and there are some fascinating trials using umbilical cord blood lately. Um, they've been trying to do this in Gainesville, Florida for a while. Since 2009, they did some studies, and in December 2011, they did cord blood transplants to see if people could survive longer and their beta cells would survive longer if they just gave them cord blood. It didn't work. It was safe, but it didn't increase their C-peptide. It did not increase their beta cell function. However, oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. In Brazil in 2009, and also with colleagues at Northwestern, um, they used a person's own stem cells to replace their immune system. OK, because these are stem cells. They can be anything. So they said, instead of focusing on them becoming beta cells, can I actually reprogram a person's immune system so it doesn't attack their pancreas? So they said, can I use my own stem cells to become immune cells and not attack the pancreas? And this was actually very promising, and these are still ongoing, because they just started in 2009. They took adults, and they made them insulin-free for 31 months on average by doing this. And it was safe. So very cool. That's almost three years where they did not require insulin just from getting stem cells. January 2012. This is very new, and I have a patient who participated in this trial. There is a man named Dr. Zhao who's at UIC and does work in China. And he took stem cells from cord blood from a donor. 
and had this cord blood stem cells re-educate the cells that destroy the beta cells. So again, what they're doing is modifying the immune system so it doesn't attack someone's beta cells. And so he took someone else's stem cells to sort of speak to these immune system targets and say, okay, don't attack these guys. And so far, this is just January 2012, so very new stuff. He has shown that within 12 weeks, their A1Cs went from 8.7 on average to 6.82 in 12 weeks without any other changes in therapy. I mean, we'd have to, re we'd have to reduce their insulin doses, or they did. And they also increased C-peptide. I keep call talking about C-peptide. Do you guys know what C-peptide is? C-peptide is the same as insulin. It's secreted in the same quantities as insulin, so it's a good way for us to measure how much insulin you're making. Because if I measure insulin, I'm going to be measuring what you're taking that I give you and what you make. So C-peptide is just the insulin, really, that you make is what it's an indication of. And so what that means is if it increased, that person made it on their own. It wasn't insulin that we gave them. Pretty remarkable, right? So we have to wait to see if these people tolerated those stem cells and had any adverse reactions. But I think this is amazing. Um, and a long ways to go, but I think it's amazing. So next slide. So the next is artificial pancreas. So what is an artificial pancreas? Because um, a lot of people throw around these words, but just to clarify what it is, it means I have something outside of my body that acts like the pancreas. So what does it do? It picks up what the blood sugar is, responds to it, and decreases it if it's high, and increases it if it's low. So it's a closed loop system, which is a glucose sensor that talks to a pump that delivers both insulin and glucagon as needed to either increase or decrease your blood sugar. So you do not depend on the person and their brain to do this. Pretty remarkable. The only issue is, what do we do during the day? We eat. And a sensor won't know that unless we tell it that we're eating, right? It can detect all our glucoses, so it can only respond after the fact right now. But they did studies already in Europe that show that this works overnight when you're not eating. Overnight when you're not eating and the person was asleep, they programmed formulas and they said, if glucose is this, give this much insulin. And it worked. And it kept the patient's blood sugar normal overnight without dropping low. And if it dropped low, it automatically turned off for, for one to two hours. I can't remember exactly how long, but it automatically turned off and came back on the pump. Pretty neat, right? Um, so the problem is we're a little bit delayed in this sort of research here just because of some FDA regulation issues. So the JDRF is working with the FDA to have approval in the US. The last draft was March 2011 of a policy to allow artificial pancreas to, uh, to be accepted here as a treatment modality. The issue is the FDA first said, I need people to show me that it's better than what we do now. And the JDRF came back and, and endocrinologists and researchers came back and said, we shouldn't have to show that it's better, just that you have fewer low blood sugars. Because that's one of the biggest concerns, right, especially with the young ones overnight, is nobody wants to keep their sugar 100 when they go to bed and you guys all give them snacks because you're afraid it's going to drop or it drops. So the point was, it might not be perfect just yet, but if it can save them from a low blood sugar, especially overnight, I still think we should be able to use it, even if the A1C is not quite reduced just yet. So that's what the JDRF and uh, FDA are working together on. That's called a non-inferiority study. So we're not necessarily showing that it's superior, but it's not worse than what's going on now. And eventually, I think we can show that it's superior. Next slide. So, um, the JDRF funded a trial uh, of artificial pancreas closed-loop systems in 13 sites across the world. You guys might have seen it on CNN, and I think Rose referred me to uh, the CNN um, uh, news flash on it. And this was in March 2012. Did anybody see that? No? So there's a woman, the girl named Elle, I think it was, who's 12, that participated in one of these trials at Harvard. And it's a three-day trial, so it wasn't like Elle got to wear this thing for a while. She just went in for three days and uh, never had to check a sugar and never had to give a dose. The thing was just connected to her as a sensor and a pump, and it did everything for her. And in those three days, they actually had very good data. So it's looking promising. This is an ongoing trial, though, again. So very cool, right? Um, in this case, it's a little different than the, the artificial pancreas concepts in Europe. This had both insulin and glucagon. So if your sugar were low, 
it would give you glucagon. If your sugar was high, it would give you insulin with a pre-programmed computerized kind of mechanism in there. Next slide. The next thing is encapsulation. So before I talk about this, remember the beta cell again that's being attacked, right, by all of these other cells of our immune system? And so even if I take a transplant from somebody else, Jared told me my beta cell still is going to be attacked, still going to be attacked, excuse me. So they said, well, what if when I got a transplant, whether it's a stem cell or an actual pancreatic islet cell transplant from someone else, what if I could put it in a protective capsule such that it does not get attacked? What if I can fool our immune system somehow to think that this is part of their own body? That's what encapsulation is. So they're looking at that. And what they're looking at is that, well, first of all, it needs to have waste products be able to go out of the cell and other important nutrients come through. So it can't be a complete barrier. It has to be semi-permeable, meaning some things need to be able to go through, just not the immune system, okay? So the concept was first used in the 1980s, but not to beta cells until more recently. And in March 2011, again, this is all in the past year, if you guys don't see this trend, right? This is all happening very recently. March 2011, they had their second meeting in seven years um, of, of about 40 worldwide experts on this um, to talk about how can we do this better. And there's something called a polymer, which is the substance that they encapsulate this with. And they're looking at different polymers and how they can work to better do this. Um, this is a website. If you guys just go to countdown.jdrf.org, you can see all of this. And I'll give you some websites at the end to read about this on your own. Next slide. So there are seven promising ongoing trials um, on encapsulation. And many have cured in mice. Again, the rodents have it better than we do. They're doing really well with all these things. Um, but hopefully we'll get more human data soon. Um, but we've definitely seen improvement in blood sugar control in human studies, but not so much longer term A1C. Um, the companies that are doing this research, in case you hear these names, are LCT, Cernova, Circo, Viasite, Nuvalex, and then if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, it lists any NIH-sponsored trials on this topic of encapsulation. Next slide. Oh, so next is biomarkers, or what they're uh, focusing on as well as a big research area. So this is... Each of us is programmed with DNA, right? So we each have things that are our blueprint that say, this is Anita Swamy, this is Karen Ballard, and it differentiates us. So type 1 diabetes is not the same in everybody who has it. Uh, I have patients who need 10 units a day for five years, and I have ones that need 150 units a day. They both have type 1. And they're not necessarily different weight, age, or gender. So there's got to be something about them that's different from one another. And those are called biomarkers. And that means there's different proteins, different components of their body that make them respond to treatment differently. And the same as different components that make them get diabetes. There's something about their beta cells that are being attacked more than anyone else's. So that is saying, I'm going to look at this a little bit deeper and say, why is it that you got attacked and he didn't? What is on your beta cell? So if I understand it, maybe I can get rid of that thing on your beta cells that makes you get attacked, right? Maybe it's not just your immune system goes wrong, but maybe it's something that's your own beta cells that are triggering the attack. And then why, why does this person respond better than that person? Maybe if I can find what made them respond better, I can use that same therapy to reduce the insulin requirement in this next person. So that's individual biomarkers. So what they're doing is just studies taking people with diabetes without diabetes and with different levels of diabetes, they run all these proteins through that these people have and, s and see what lights up that's different. And when they can identify these proteins, they say maybe we can use these as targets for therapy. Pretty neat concept. Does that make sense to you guys? So that's called biomarker studies. In 2008, there was a study of 10 patients who were just diagnosed versus those that didn't have diabetes. They looked at all their proteins and they actually found five that were distinctly different between the two groups. That was one of the first things that was reported. There were many other trials in 2007 and 8, and now we're also looking at not only do they have proteins that differ, but when we take pictures of these beta cells, they look different. So maybe when someone's diagnosed, we'll start taking pictures of their beta cells and be able to tell them, you're going to need 10 units the rest of your life. 
versus the next person we can say, you know, this is going to stress you out, but he's going to need about 150 units by the time we're done. Maybe if we had that information, that would be useful clinically for me to treat you better. Okay, next slide. Okay, so this, I think, is kind of one of the neatest things. So insulin was discovered in 1921, right? So we've created lots of different kinds to try to mimic what our own body makes, but they're not perfect, as you guys know, right? My long-acting insulins that I inject don't last 24 hours. I mean, I'm sure the company reps are all going to bang me over the head with a big pan, but I think that's true. They don't last exactly how I want them to. They don't work the way my own insulin would. But this is the best we have right now. And then we have the pump that delivers it, but it takes a lot of work. You've got to program it. You've got to tell it exactly how much you're eating. You have to control it when you're exercising. You have to increase it when you're not and when you're sick. So what if we had a better insulin that only worked when your sugar was high? Wouldn't that be cool? And it did not release when your sugar is low or normal. And that's the concept behind something called smart cells. Smart Cells is a company that was created on their own. Merck just acquired them recently. And um, they did rodent and pig studies already. Again, the rodents um, and the pigs, they have it pretty good, in 2008 and 9. And this was discovered actually by an MIT researcher um, who said, can I put something around these insulins that make them only start working when the glucose is high, such that they're sensing the glucose, and when enough glucose molecules attach onto a certain product, these insulins are promoted to explode and start working. Okay? So that's, I think, pretty amazing. So this is smart insulin, smart cells. Next slide. This is a picture of them. So this is ordinary insulin. The smart insulins attach to that orange thing, which is their kind of glue that ties them together, and the glue only breaks when sugar levels get high enough to break that glue. Okay? So that's smart insulin technology. Next slide. So we're almost done with all this, but it's a lot to take in, right? This is pretty exciting, I think. And so primary and secondary prevention. So the other focuses are studies to prevent diabetes in people that don't yet have it, but are at high risk for it, and to secondarily prevent it from getting worse once you get it. That's what these studies are. So primary prevention is, can we prevent diabetes in those at high risk? I already talked to you guys about vaccinating people. Can I find people at high risk, give them a vaccine so their own immune system doesn't attack the beta cell? So there's people already doing that. That was that Swedish study that I was telling you about, uh, Diaprevit. There is also other studies. I'm just giving you an example. But Trigger is a study from 2002 to 2017 in Ontario and they're looking at study on infant formulas in high-risk kits. So they're taking babies who have family members with type 1 diabetes who have a high risk for getting it and feeding them different component, different types of infant formulas to see if certain exposure to proteins in those formulas causes them to get diabetes later or if certain other proteins are protective. Okay, so there are lots of theories on this. So we, I'm excited to see what the outcomes will be. Secondary prevention trial is, once we have diabetes, can we prevent insulin dependence? So can we make those beta cells continue to work once you actually have them fail? Can we somehow have them function for a long time, kind of like an extended honeymoon? So there have been a lots of older studies on this. One was nicotinamide. Another one was giving insulin at the onset of diabetes. Actually makes you work better longer. So it is important that we figure out when people have it early because the earlier you're diagnosed, the better you will do. But now we're looking at other therapies so that if we catch someone early, can we prolong their course so they don't get sick and lose that function? Next slide. This is also something that I was particularly interested in is eye disease. So just to let you guys know why we also annoy you and make you go to the eye doctor every year is one of the first signs of diabetes complications occurs in the eye. And I always tell this to my patients. So I say, we have sugar that's flowing through your bloodstream. When you let your sugar get high, it's like pipes or balloons that are in your body that are carrying all sorts of nutrients to the rest of your body. So when your sugar expands, it expands these balloons. And if I'm doing this and letting the sugar get really, really high, what do you think happens to those balloons? They burst, or those pipes burst. So insulin is what keeps them from expanding in the bloodstream. That's why you have to take insulin, ideally before you eat and every time you eat. There are exceptions that we make to that. But that's why I don't want those blood vessels to fill up and burst. 
But if you do that long enough and you don't treat your diabetes appropriately, one of the first things, one of the first places where blood vessels burst is those little fragile vessels that feed your eye, okay? And how we look at that is through an eye exam. So this is the front of the eye. This is our pupil and the front of the eye. So light gets reflected onto the back of the eye, makes an image, and then that's what we see. That's our vision. So the back of the eye, there's a certain area called the macula. And that's where your focus occurs, your main focus. So in diabetes longstanding, now this is not in our kits, because we're not going to have this happen. We'll prevent it, right? But in longstanding diabetes where someone doesn't take care of themselves, what happens is you start getting these little hemorrhages. This is where those blood vessels burst, and then it becomes white. So then the natural eye says, I'll make more blood vessels to feed those areas because it broke down. So then it makes all of these abnormal vessels. It makes way too many. It doesn't know how to do this right. So it starts tearing against the eye, and this area gets pulled off. And that's called macular degeneration. OK? So that's diabetic eye disease. Next slide. So what they're looking at, which is really neat, um, Calvista is another company that partnered with JDRF in January of this year. Again, this year, all these things are happening. And calacrine is an enzyme that builds up that leads to eye disease. They found that all of this new activity that tears off the back of the eye and causes macular degeneration is due to accumulation of this one substance called calacrine. And they said, could I block that with a drug? so that even if you have this happening, it doesn't cause this process to happen. And that's what they're looking at. So there's ongoing research in this. So once you already have it, can I prevent it from causing disease? And then Lucentis is another antibody that blocks leakage of fluid into the eye. And this is both important for type 1 and type 2s get this, by the way. So this is usually in those that have had diabetes for 20 years or more and generally not well controlled. Okay? That's why we always want your A1Cs to be a target because the studies show that those above target are the ones who get this. And previously, you can only treat eye disease with laser, but this type of therapy is really promising. Next slide. I think we've come a long way. So I just wanted to share all of that with you guys. Don't you think we've come a long way? Yeah. So this is an exciting time to be in the world of diabetes. I don't think that it is uh, depressing. Um, I know day to day it's very tough to do this, but there's a lot of promise in our future, and I definitely think in my lifetime there'll be a cure. Um, I hope that we're all out of work someday. Um, so I think we could all find things to occupy our time with, right? Um, so thank you. That's it. <laughs> next slide. Karen, there, next slide. So these are important sites for you to refer to where I got most of my information. I encourage you guys to go on to clinicaltrials.gov to look up all the clinical trials that are in existence. So if you're interested in signing up, you can do that. And then diabetes.org or jdrf.org tells you about all of the things that I just mentioned, such as stem cell research and all the different therapies. Thank you, guys.